I think that's like part of like the mission of Half Crown Bakehouse is to sort of connect things that were in the past before and now, you know, shift 200 plus years later. And now we're trying to like rekindle those relationships between farmers and millers and bakers and trying to reestablish like that whole system of foodways, which is all very, very slow because it's built over time. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Good Dirt Podcast. We're so happy to have you here joining us for another episode. But first, we want to catch everyone up a little bit as we've had so much going on at Lady Farmer over the last couple of weeks. Yes, we're almost halfway through our four-week slow living challenge. And we really loved hearing from all of you and seeing your beautiful posts and insights. One of the first prompts last week that really sparked a lot of great discussion within the Almanac was the day when we were supposed to do nothing for five minutes. It was a fun one. Some of the words that came up as people described just the anticipation of this exercise, like before they even did it, were hard, challenging, terrifying, anxious, guilt, failure, bored, even no way, which is so funny because the suggestion was to literally do nothing. But somehow it creates all this anxiety and insecurity. and yeah. yeah, it's really crazy how we do that. So here's some reactions from our community members on this one exercise. So this person had just finished. Okay, I just completed five minutes of doing nothing. The beginning, I was all agitated and it was actually kind of hard to sit still. But then I kind of melted into it. It felt really comfortable hearing the dinner on the stove, cars outside, other small sounds around the house. And before I knew it, five minutes was up. It was very enjoyable. And then she kind of laughs and it's like we kind of build it up to this thing and it's hard. And then you notice sounds, which is another one of our prompts from the Slow Living Challenge, which is an amazing thing. Yeah. Do you want to read the next one? Okay. This person says, this was lovely, honestly. But as soon as I saw the prompt today, my brain went, no way we have time for that. Oddly, this slow living challenge is happening at a time when life is getting even busier for me. But I think that's going to make all the difference. I checked back in just now this evening and was feeling like I needed to make a plan to do this exercise, like get out the yoga mat, light a candle or something. But before I knew it, as I was scrolling, two minutes had gone by. So I just unceremoniously put down my phone and sat for five minutes. And it was a wonderful reset before I conquered the rest of my tasks today. Thank you. I love this one so much because I can relate so much. And I'm sure a lot of you can too about you don't have to make a big thing out of it. You just do it. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes it's sort of an avoidance thing to think, oh, I have to do this first before I can do that. Right. So it's good to be conscious of, I have to do nothing really well. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. (laughs) I have to do nothing right. Yeah. (laughs) And then that kind of leads into this next one, which I love. I love this community member so much. Always has such insightful things to say. She says, I think it is hard for many people to do nothing because we live in a culture that is telling us that our self-worth is connected to our productivity. Taking the time to do nothing can help us see just how oppressive this patriarchal culture is, and that can result in us feeling anxious. We may also become more attuned to our bodies and the emotions stored within them. To do nothing is rarely a pleasant experience at first, but to do nothing is a radical act of resistance. In a world where so many corporations are amassing wealth through the commodification of our attention, when we do nothing, we are saying, no, my attention already has a home and it's right here. (gasps) Oh my gosh. That's great. I I love the radical act of resistance. 
So cool. It's so true. It is radical to do nothing as people are experiencing through this exercise. Yeah. So interesting. And if you haven't joined in the Slow Living Challenge, it's not too late. You can sign up at www.ladyfarmer.com slash slow living challenge or at the link in the show notes of this episode. And you'll get immediate access to the prompts for the first two weeks. And then you'll get next week's prompts on Monday. And of course, keep sharing your experiences with us and with one another. With things like this, it's so easy to feel like we are the only ones who are having these thoughts, feelings, and even struggling with slowing down. But working together through this as a community has really been powerful and so insightful. I've just enjoyed it so much. Yeah. And don't we have people weighing in on Instagram as well? Yes. This post on Instagram from Through the Wildwood really spoke to me. It's a photo of her scoring a loaf of bread and she quotes from the book. The truth is that we have the same amount of time as did our ancestors and grandparents. The difference is how we choose to spend it. That's from the Lady Farmer Guide to Slow Living, which is available in our marketplace. And Through the Wildwood says, One of my goals this year is to become a better steward of my time so that I am spending it wisely and intentionally instead of letting it fall through the cracks of busy or lazy days. This doesn't mean that I have to always fill my time with something but rather that I am more deliberate about how I am resting, working, and playing. And then she asks, how are you spending your time this winter? And this caption really spoke to me because it made me think we have agency with our time. It's so easy to feel like we're a victim to time, yeah. that it's running us over or that we can't keep up or something like that. But yeah, it's like we have agency here. So yes, even though it's easy to think, I don't have time. That's almost a mantra of our culture, right? But guess what? You do have time. Yeah. (laughs) That's pretty much all we have, right? Yeah. And then in response to the prompt that was the theme for the first week, which was to acknowledge a slow living practice, we have this beautiful post from Farmhouse Mama, and it also featured a loaf of bread. So she says, my house was built in 1911. There are bits here and there of vintage wallpaper, bright teal walls, nails that wiggle their way out, and ornate doorknobs. It's cold, it's drafty, it's loving, it's my dream. Every time I stand here against my picture window, kneading bread, I wonder how many mothers before me did the same. I wonder if the trees had ever held together a clothesline in the summer. How many babies were breastfed? How many were rocked to sleep listening to our own sticky toes touching the hardwood beneath us? I always think about the lives that were given in this house and the ones that were taken away. Someone built this house with their own two hands, and I am forever grateful. I love that. It reminds me so much of when I was a young person in my 20s, when I first discovered bread baking. I had the same thoughts. I said, how many people have done this before me through thousands and thousands of years? Such a connection with our ancestors and all the humans that came before us. Mm, Just so beautiful. Thank you, Farmhouse Mama, for sharing that. We are looking at all these posts, so if you use the hashtag slow living challenge hashtag, we will see them, and they might show up here on the podcast, so please continue to share, and the best part about these two is that they both featured bread. Well, they were about more than bread, but the photos were these beautiful pictures of bread and or bread baking, and today... Our podcast episode is all about bread. So funny how that works out. And we definitely didn't plan it that way. It happens so often. (laughs) And I'm so excited today to share our chat with historical baker Justin Cherry. Yeah. And before we jump into that, I did want to mention last week's episode with Lynn Cassells of Lynn Brett Croft. If you haven't listened yet, definitely go back and listen to it. It's so worth it. And we want to remind you that you can pre-order their upcoming book, Our Wild Farming Life, on the Lady Farmer Marketplace. And if you pre-order your book here through us, you will be invited. You'll get a free ticket to a Zoom meet and greet Q&A with Lynn, the author of Our Wild Farming Life book in April-ish. We haven't set an exact date, so stay tuned for that. But this will be a ticketed event, meet the author, and we're so excited to have her back to chat with our community. So that's a really fun lady farmer thing that you can do. And speaking of past episodes, you might remember our discussion with Sarah Marie Massey. She's a lead interpreter at George Washington's Mount Vernon, and she gave us a glimpse into the textile industry of the 18th century. Well, today's guest also has ties to Mount Vernon. He's a living history fellow who is passionate about the history of grains and 18th century bread baking. His name is Justin Cherry. 
He's a historical reenactor and baker, founder and owner of Half Crown Bakehouse, which is based in Charleston, South Carolina. But Justin travels all around to living history events with his 18th century reproduction clay oven, baking breads with heritage and often rare grain varieties reflecting period-correct methods and flavors. We were fascinated by Justin's in-depth knowledge of the history and evolution of grains and their uses and his passion for keeping this part of our history alive for all of us to experience and appreciate firsthand. It's quite delicious, as I can say. Yeah, we first met Justin at an event in Waterford, Virginia last fall. and We asked him to come talk with us on the good dirt. And since then, we've caught up with him at two other historical events to stock up on several loaves of his amazing bread. You can only get it from him in person, which is another slow living aspect to his business. So we buy several loaves at once, slice them and freeze them to enjoy until the next time we can get to him. As a maker who is deeply serious and passionate about his craft, as you'll see in this interview, Justin represents the kind of intention and respect for tradition that we consider to be a really important aspect of slow living. He sums up the purpose of his business with this quote from his website. In the 18th century, the bakehouse and hearth were the central part of the home, and it is our duty to rekindle that flame. Using authentic and local ingredients to the era is the mission of Half Crown Bakehouse. Justin is so full of knowledge and has so much to share. Now we'll let him take over here to tell you his story. So here's Justin Cherry. My name is Justin Cherry, and I run Half Crown Bakehouse, which is a mobile 18th century clay oven that travels pretty much to historic sites, historic events. And I also do farmer's markets in South Carolina when I'm home. And the whole reason I kind of formed uh, Half Crown Bakehouse is because I had this deep, deep love of working with heritage grains and working with land race grains, which like land race are grains that have adapted regionally over time. It's so interesting to work with them now because these you know seeds have been saved over time and then geneticists have looked at them and see if they're the same structure as they were you know back in the 18th century or even earlier. And now I kind of took that, my love of grains, with living history, which I did since I was four years old. So all those things cross paths at one point or another. And I had a fellowship at Mount Vernon at the library to research food ways of George Washington's life and the 18th century in general. And that kind of scoped out a whole lot of research, which I do during the week when I'm not traveling at events. I sort of compile primary sources and it's so much fun because it's just like it's following a trail of, you know, a certain grain or of breadcrumbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who were the bakers? Who, yeah. who were the bakers of the American Revolution? Who were the bakers of these, uh, you know, giant southern plantations and even into like indigenous and enslaved peoples like who was doing the baking how are they doing the baking and it's such a fun thing to demonstrate in front of people and really like get your hands into the flour and water and say like hey i don't have a mixer that i plug in mm -hmm. you know i haven't i haven't yeah. used the plug-in mixer for you know over four years so it's it's really interesting to see their reaction to that and kind of tie them back to how things used to be done and sort of slow things down a bit and I just love that that brings slow living into it that brings the traditional food and traditional knowledge and all this stuff just sort of comes together and I I love the way you combine your love of history and your curiosity with the grains and the baking and it just sounds like you've come up with such an awesome model to go around and just demonstrate to people what you're doing and to talk about the history right. of the food and we think that's particularly interesting from the standpoint of helping people understand what has happened to our food and like what most of us are eating these days 
and how it got that way. So can you talk a little bit about the grains you're using versus what is commonly available nowadays? Like if you walked into the store and you, of course you bought a loaf of bread, what's the difference in those grains? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So the grains that I'm using, kind of like I mentioned before, are all, all heritage grains, which basically breaks them into a category of like pre-1850. And if you separate a little bit deeper, um, we're talking pre-roller mills, so like pre-1820 or so. So we're talking all things being ground via windmill or water wheel, grist mill, stones. So if you kind of break it into that, then that process itself is separating from what we know is like modern bread. Even if you're grinding, you know, your own wheat nowadays, it's still a process of friction between the stones and it heating up. And the stones on traditional grist mills you know, they're so large that primarily they're cold and mills are cold to be in. Even like when it's a little bit hot out, like the stones are still cold because they're giant. And that creates, without that heat between them, it kind of, I don't want to say it like kills the grain, but the colder the stones, and this is a practice that like Anson Mills does today, like they grind all their stuff that's been like frozen prior. So it doesn't, you don't lose like nutrients. And in today's bread, you know, some of those nutrients are lost because because either it's flour that's been sifted so much, like all the nutrients are taken out, like the brands taken out and all those things are sifted. Not to say that didn't happen in the 18th century with sale of flour, because like the whiter the flour back then, the higher the price it fetched. And like the lower price flour was actually the stuff with all of the bran and all of the nutrients in. And now we've kind of switched, we've kind of flipped that model that, you know, the healthier the bread now, the more expensive it is. And back then it was middle class slash poor people are eating healthier bread. In that sense, the grains that I'm using are a lot more healthy for you because I'm using everything. Um, even the stuff that when it does go through like Washington's Mount Vernon grist mill, they are sifting stuff, but all that bran I put back in to make it more of what's known back then. It's like a household bread. So there's like bran folded in. And, you know, today when you walk into the store and you buy flour, unless it's from somebody that doesn't bleach it or bromates it, which that's like the addition of potassium bromate and that strengthens dough like when you mix it. So without that bromated flour, without that process of potassium bromate, you just have to mix it a little longer or you have to work it a little longer to get that, you know, elasticity of the dough. So if you can get unbromated, unbleached flour, that's great from the store or if you can get it from somebody local or grain itself local and mill it yourself, that's definitely going to be more healthy because all the things that are sort of added, it's because they're added because when you go to the store, it's like a dead flower. I don't want to say it's like a dead flower, but it's yeah. been in there for quite some time. That's also interesting. I also want to ask a quick question about, I've never heard of the word bromated before. Is that something that's going to be on the bag? Like you can look for, would it say non-bromated? Yeah. So it'll say bromated and that's like the big you know, I want to say like the big mills, like General Mills, or even the people that really, if you're looking for a commercial brand in a store mm. that doesn't bromate and doesn't bleach, that's King Arthur Okay. from Vermont. So that's what I buy. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a thing to look for because okay. yes, it does help with elasticity, but a lot of commercial bakeries use it because one, it's cheap. You can buy probably a 25 pound bag for like 10 bucks. And compared to if you spend a little more money, you can get something that's, there's not a chemical like potassium bromate, like in that added to it and it's not bleached. And cause you want the true color, the true flavor, the true nutrients of wheat. You know, if you're making something that is, you know, and a lot of people, the bad thing is, is that taste buds have been trained over the past yeah. since pretty much industrialization you know, in like the 1920s or so, or turn of the 20th century. People have been trained to, this is what I like because this is what I know. A lot of bread has sugar in it and some of it's used to help yeast in the mixing of the bread, but it doesn't add anything over time. I mean, that's why, you know, white bread can sit there for weeks and not go moldy. That's an interesting phenomenon. Years ago, I had a, a friend who had moved her family over from Holland and she had the kids in school and all, and she, you know, was making the sandwiches. And she said to me one day, what is this bread? <laughs> she said, I bought it three weeks ago and it's still 
soft. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, this was back in the 90s. This is kind of before I went on this journey of learning all this stuff. But I want to add a little something to what you were saying. You know, so many people have digestive issues these days right. and they've totally cut out grains because grains are the bad guy, which they are when you're eating the industrialized grains. And I don't think people really realize the extent to which this stuff has been messed with. Number one, most commercially grown grains are grown with the GMO varieties that are resistant to glyphosate. And that's the chemical that they spray on everything right before harvest to get the weeds down so they can easily harvest it. So most of your industrialized grains have been blasted with, and glyphosate is a patented antibiotic. So most of your grains have been blasted. They don't talk about it as an antibiotic, but it acts that way, right? So, and then you're eating that, you're putting it in your gut and all this stuff now that we know about the microbiome in your gut, what do you think that does in your gut to your ability to digest and fight off illness and all these things? It's just huge to me. I don't hear too many people talking about this way, but this is, and y'all, I'm not an expert or a scientist. This is just me putting two and two together, like common sense, right? So there's that. So then everybody goes, oh, I'm sensitive to gluten. Well, you, you know, gluten might be part of it, but I think in many cases, that's just the tip of the iceberg with these grains. You know, there's so much more than that. The lack of nutrients is what's been changed. And even like the way you're telling us, the way it's ground. I mean, there's just so much to this. I think the process of how grains have been ground over time, you know, when we changed the roller mills and I'm not saying roller mills are bad by any means because it was just an advancement of technology at the time. You know, we switched from stones to that, but it's just... The fact that for a good part of the early 20th century, a lot of grains were grown for horse feed and for beer. And obviously a lot of that stopped, you know, during prohibition, the same way with like distilling of, you know, whiskey and, and spirits and that kind of stuff. And that's when a lot of the grains were actually lost is when we stopped doing that. That whole system that kind of changed in the 20th century, it shifted kind of a way of life for a lot of regions. Mm -hmm. So within that, I mean, that change alone shifted the whole vortex of grain use and grain culture. So that's kind of what I speak a little bit about when, you know, I talk about grains and I usually have like a grain board that has all the varieties of grains that I use and variety of different uses, because back then there was, you know, softer wheats you use for cookies and cakes and things like that and harder wheats used for bread. I mean, people don't even know what barley tastes like anymore, like real barley. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of shocking that, you know, when you make something out of barley, they're like, what's that taste I'm getting? What's that like earthiness? It's a little bit bitter, but it's like kind of earthy and it's like barley. Barley now is just, you know, ground and it's made in the cereal. If people know barley, they know it from cereal or they know it from like beer. And it's like barley was a giant grain culture in the 18th century. And that's what kind of helped a lot of things expansion move West because, you know, for a period it's other than like the colonies post 1780s, we were looking at how we can go West. And when people travel, grain travels because you have to have some way to feed yourself. Because at that point, North America, the only thing really indigenous, the only kind of grain is corn. And, you know, that all evolved from South America, North America with the spread of indigenous people. So if we don't have those varieties of corn and different indigenous people growing them, then whenever we pushed West, it was different varieties of corn, but they hadn't seen wheat yet. And that was all brought for European. Corn was always here. I mean, I just started this year using a fantastic corn. And what people don't know is like corn is not when, you know, when people think of corn, they think in general of like, oh, it's like corn on the cob, like sweet corn. And then any kind of corn that you use for cornmeal and all that stuff, like that's dent corn. And that's biggest corn grown in the United States is some yellow dent corn number two, which is you know, used in whiskey, used in cornmeal, but there are so many different types of corn. You know, if you go down like into Mexico, there's like 10,000 varieties and it's astonishing, but I just started using a corn this year in some of my events because everywhere I travel, it's sort of different based on the region. So I use the grains that were most popular at that time period in that region. And a lot of the corn back then, it was traded and bought through indigenous people. So I started using this corn that is a project that was started probably about 
about 15 years ago or so. And it's from the Haudenosaunee people, um, which is like the Iroquois Confederacy. So that covers a variety of indigenous people, such as like the Seneca, and that's like upstate New York and upper Pennsylvania. And they actually do a corn, Iroquois white corn, that their whole project, it's a small group of people that grow it, and then they traditionally dry it out, and then they grind it. And it's like the most fantastic corn flavor. And this corn variety has been protected kind of by those. It's not really commercially available unless you go there and you purchase like, you know, one pound bag or so, but they agreed to send me quite a bit of poundage so I could cover some events and it's been protected for 1400 years. Oh, that's amazing. It's just outstanding. And like, if I can tell that story, because that story intertwines with the European story of, you know, like thirded bread or brown bread, where it's like wheat, rye, and corn, and all those things kind of coming together because wheat fetched such a high price. It was cut with rye, which was grown quite frequently in the colonies, and corn. So those things make up, you know, like what we now know is like Boston brown bread that's like, you know, cooked in a coffee can or a steam can like that. You know, originally that was thirded bread. Um, so it was a third wheat, a third rye, and a third corn. I have this weed in my yard that's really, really prolific and voluntary. It's a type of knotweed and is called lady's thumb and it's also related to amaranth. Okay. Yeah. Have you heard of this? And it gets a little, the pink flower and then that dries mm-hmm. up and you have these little grainy things. Well, yeah. I ran across, I forget how I even ran across this, but some research from some PhD somewhere says they ate this and it was how a lot of the super early North American people thrived. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Amaranth is actually, it's a widespread kind of in Virginia. Yeah. Early 17th, 18th century. Like you'll find a lot of records in Williamsburg that document like amaranth and using it. So, you know, that's like one of those wild things. Yes. That was here. It's a weed. Yeah. It's a weed. And it's like people were using it because someone at some point said, Hey, we can use this because probably, you know, a lot of that comes along and there's not success with what they're growing. Yeah. Even if they, you know, were trying to grow wheat, they still use amaranth. That's like one of those natural things, just like rye. A lot of people don't know that they probably have an 18th or 19th century variety of rye growing in their regular grass, but they have no idea because it kept on replanting itself over and over and over again. Well, have you seen this pink lady's thumb? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's I do. It's really pretty. It's yeah, very, very pretty. pretty. It's all over the place. And I have actually just casually grabbed a handful of those seeds and munched on them. And they're very nutty and good. And it's really delicious. Would that be something like, would they have milled that? Or is that just like they would eat the seeds? Yeah. I think they actually might have, if they had enough quantity, they could mill it. Okay. You know, there's a lot of cereals. They're not like what we know, like wheat or corn or buckwheat Mm. or something like that. Like that was ground. Yeah. So whether it was like hand impounded, which, you know, if you had a small amount, you would just hand impound it. Yeah. You know, a mortar pestle or like uh, even a kern, which is like the hand mill. Yeah. And also like when you see this is early like corn practice of like backcountry houses, like 18th and 19th century, if you see like a small little, almost like a grindstone or a large rock that has kind of like a mortar pestle look to it in the front of the house. Like that was because they were probably hand impounding corn or even wheat Mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford to like take it to a mill. But yeah, I've actually seen amaranth in some 19th century cookie recipes where you can just kind of like hand impound it. Or today, obviously, you can run it through probably like a coffee grinder if you don't have like a a mill, tabletop mill. Do you think, let's say I'm going to like harvest a cup of this and make some cookies or something just Mm -hmm. for fun. Would I wait until the pink color is gone of those little grains or get it and dry it out in the hydrator or something? What would you do if you were experimenting with this? Yeah, I would just wait till it kind of dries out naturally and then take it. Mm -hmm. That'll mean that it's probably getting more nutrients in it while it's still in the ground rather than like Mm -hmm. taking it and then I don't want to say like forcing it, but like forcing it to dry. Um, That way it like takes all the nutrients kind of out of the plant itself. I would be processing it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Over processing. So you wouldn't believe the amount of this plant that I have to pull out because if I just left it alone, it would be all I had. 
it really is so prolific, but I've intentionally left some batches. So I'm going to play with it a little bit. So yeah. Yeah. Experimentation is probably at least half of what I do, because if we're talking like 18th and 19th century cookbooks, which I've yeah. <laughs> been through quite a lot and, you know, originals and all that kind of stuff. And I have a very firm belief that cookbooks, people are getting a lot better now, but like maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when you buy a tabletop cookbook, are you actually cooking from it or is it just sitting there and you're looking at the pictures? <laughs> Yeah. Because I feel like 18th century cookbooks were, you know, if, if you're in a upper middle class to, to pretty wealthy owner, one, you're the only people that could probably afford those books. And two, literacy rates were way down back then, even though people were reading. But, you know, if you're the owner of a large plantation, do you think that the owner of the house is sitting there and reading the cookbook and then dictating? Right. The people who are reading probably weren't the people in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. And <laughs> it's also that's a whole creative kind of process on what made American cuisine. It wasn't there was some English influence. Mm -hmm. Sure. But a lot of it was through, you know, enslaved chefs and cooks and putting their own touches from what they know, because that's how things get passed on. Mm -hmm. And cookbooks were definitely a status symbol in the 18th century because, you know, your library in the 18th century was, this is my library and look how many books do I have. You might have read some of them. You're not the one doing the practicing after you read it. So now we're getting a little bit better because people are using cookbooks and things like that. But some people just cook, just like kind of go with it and we'll see what happens. And a lot of that is what I do. I like to kind of call it like culinary archaeology because you are digging up things and documents from the past and you're applying them to what you would think happened. Mm -hmm. And with, you know, the resources that they had and kind of the know-how that they had, let's put this together because the only thing that I have to go off of, of what bread looked like in the 18th century is paintings that were most definitely owned by wealthy people. And they were painted by artists that were hired by wealthy people you know, and they weren't available for everybody to see. So like, that's what I go off of because there was no cell phone cameras walking around and taking pictures like, hey, this is what this looked like. And they were baked by people who and were in wealthy people's houses baking for the wealthy people. It's so yes. interesting. So the bread that we see that we think of is probably not the exact same bread people were eating. Yeah, because you can see very plainly, like say at George Washington's Mount Vernon, like it's very straight up, like in the records that this kind of bread was made for the household. Yeah. And then even like paid workers, some people were paid in bread, but it wasn't like the same bread that they're eating in the house. They're getting yeah. paid brown bread, which was, you know, like the thirded bread, which was like rye, corn and wheat and wow. maybe a little molasses or, you know, like cane sugar added to that. And that's what you're getting paid in. And if you go to a lower different class, you're making stuff straight out of corn because corn was so widely available that, you know, a lot of the products that indigenous enslaved and even lower class class back country folk, they're eating corn because mm -hmm. corn is what's available. You're eating porridge, you're eating almost like griddle cakes made of corn. Wheat was hard to grow and it took quite a while. And Washington kind of figured it out after a while that he had one time he was growing 14, 15, even 17 kinds of wheat, like experimenting, like what worked mm -hmm. and what worked where I'm at. And that didn't really help. I don't want to say it didn't help the general consensus of farmers in colonial America, but in that region of Virginia, it kind of inspired different types of wheat to be grown, which one of them was Red May at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century. And that's like a flower that we still use today. That's a variety still grown today. And it's kind of a cross, you know, between soft wheat and hard wheat, kind of somewhere in the middle. So can you tell us a little bit more about your oven, the one that you're currently using and that you mentioned that you travel around with? Yeah. So I actually found the design for this oven when I was doing research in Georgia, actually after uh, Glenn Roberts, who runs Anson Mills, probably one of the smartest people that I know about pretty much everything. And then he said, you know, you want to know about baking in the South, you need to go to New Ebenezer Settlement, which is in Georgia, about 
25 miles northwest of Savannah. New Ebenezer was a settlement that was people from Salzburg, called the Salzburgers, and they came over in the 1730s, and they were sponsored by England. And basically, they were Lutherans that were escaping the Central Europe area, like Germany, Austria, that kind of area, that kind of region. So when they came to America, the first thing they were meant to do was to grow wheat because... That's like the first thing you do is you try to grow grain. And they weren't successful the first couple of years. And then they moved the settlement like four or five miles upriver on the Savannah River. And they set up there and they found some success with growing wheat. And it's literally right across the river from like South Carolina. So it splits South Carolina and uh, Georgia. And this settlement was so great because not only did they plant wheat, they also had the first grist mill in Georgia, which was like 1740. And because they needed somewhere to grind that grain, and they set up a few of those grist mills. And the crazy thing is, is that since they were sponsored by England, they had to write reports. So that's how you get the names of the wheat. And that's how you track that grain because they had to write back to England how their crops were growing. Because the only reason they were sponsored is so they could write back and report, you know, how is this? Like, do we need to send more people there so we can make bigger settlements? And all this wheat, you know, you can't sell all the wheat. So they actually influenced the bread and flour markets of Charleston, which was about an hour and a half away. So they were known as probably the best bakers in the South at the time in the 1740s and 1750s. And their design of ovens, which I found a 19th century description of an 18th century oven. And somebody said, hey, that looks like one of those old Salzburger ovens. And they said it was built from clay from the Savannah River. And then it was packed on the bottom with wood and clay and sort of like that daubing style that you see on like log cabins. Mm -hmm. So it was built up from wood and stone and then it had a clay oven. And one of them survived into the 19th century after the town went debunked after the revolution. And they wrote about it and they said, oh, it's like five foot deep and it's like four foot wide. I'm like, that's like the description that I need. So I went to a maker of food trucks in Charleston And I said, I want to build an oven, but I don't want to do it like a modern way. I want to take the shell of an oven and then I want to cover it with like clay and mortar and make it look like this old like Georgia ovens from the 18th century. So I had it built like on a trailer and then I had a couple of other people help out with like all the woodwork. A really good friend of mine who does woodwork in Charleston got these awesome like old red oak and like hand hewed them into boards that I cover up the bottom of the oven so it hides the wheels. So it basically looks permanent. Oh, cool. So that's how it kind of like, because a lot of people are like, oh, (laughs) did you build that like this weekend? And it's like, no, this is kind of what I do for a living and that would be... That would be a lot of effort to build it. A lot of building ovens everywhere you go. (laughs) So, you know, it made it easier to transport, even though I do get a lot of funny looks on the highway. (laughs) It weighs three ton and you can bake about a hundred loaves off of one fire before you need to restart that fire. That's amazing. And you're conserving heat, you know, because you're like, you're getting the loaves in there as fast as you can and you're shutting the door. And then usually the steam from that first batch of bread kind of like preheats it for the second batch. And then the second batch preheats it for the last batch. So actually, when I start a fire at an event or a historic site for the first time, I never have to start the fire again, because I'm just constantly reusing the coals. And then if you think about, you know, 18th century methods of doing things, you can take those leftover ashes, and you can make a variety of things, you can actually make lye from it. So then you're, you can make soap, or you can also use that lye and put hominy corn in it to rinse the hull of the corn off there before you cook hominy. So there's a variety of uses of all these coals like kind of over time. And then the thing that I like to do is at the end of a event, um, like even after this weekend, I'll take all the coals, cold or not, and I'll shove them in my oven and then I'll take all of my cast iron or wrought iron original stuff that I use to cook and or display. I'll put it in my oven and close the door and it'll re-season my pans while I travel. Oh my gosh. So you'll do an oven firing for an entire weekend event or do you have to fire it every day? 
that you're, once it's fired, does it last the whole weekend? Yeah. So I'll start the fire first and then yeah. every time I pull out the ashes, I'll re-add those hot ashes back in. So I only have to really start it once. So when do you do all the mixing? Do you show up to these events with your stuff already mixed up? Everything takes place on site, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. It also depends on the weather because I'm mixing outside everywhere I go. Yeah. If it's cold, what do you do? It's cold, use warmer water. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And how do you keep it warm so it can proof? Because that would be just like putting it in the refrigerator that could stop it for days. Yeah. So the box itself, the dough box, it's like the greatest tool that nobody ever uses anymore. Because, oh. you know, when you use dough boxes now, if you go to an antique store, like they're selling it as like a magazine, you know, place to store your magazines or old pictures or, you know, stuff like that, or they repaint them. And the thing with the dough box is, is, you know, it has a lid. So as soon as you get warm water in there to combine Mm -hmm. with like your natural levant or leftover dough or barm, as soon as you add warm water to that, that temperature is not going anywhere anytime soon, especially since like dough boxes were kept usually next to the hearth or next to a fire. So they would never really go completely cold. And even actually one of the best events for like baking bread. I mean, the colder the event, the better for me because people want it. (laughs) Well, people want it and I don't want it to be so warm that it speeds up my process. Yeah. This type of baking bread and just everything about the process is much slower. And I'm interested in what you think about slow living and what slow living means to you. You know, I think slow living, honestly, is like returning to traditions that like didn't quite, you know, some, some of them get did get passed down. But I think there's like literally a slow return to slower living, more traditional things, because, you know, one, there's an interest in history and everybody likes a story that goes along with something. But the way that they were cooking and baking and living as a whole, I mean, people are like, oh, well, they had, you know, all this time. It's like, yeah, because you either had a trade or you didn't and you just provided for your family. So you weren't wasting time on a cell phone or you weren't, there wasn't extra time to be doing things because you were doing everything all day to live that day. And then the next day it just started over again. And, you know, I think that way of thinking in general is just better. And also I'm like a strong believer in like the original, like historic trades. Like now everybody wants to do everything. And it's fine if you're like, you know, off grid or like, you know, homesteading, because that's kind of a thing all of itself. But it's why I don't mill my own grain, because if I milled my grain, then what does the miller do? Yeah. Like I'm taking away a job. And it's not to say like, you know, if you're like baking at home and you're grinding your own grain, that's a little different because you're only grinding for you and you're only, you know, making bread for you and maybe your household or a couple other people. If I'm trying to provide bread for people to purchase from all the places that I travel, if I don't have a miller, if I take that job away, one, I really don't have time to do all the milling from the amount of flour that I go through. But two, like you're taking up a position that it's not what you do. Like I'm a baker and, you know, I know millers Mm -hmm. and we're friends. And that relationship is like part of the greater whole system of the food ways system. It's a life ways system. And if I take away his job, then what does he do now? Or like, who's he going to pass that on to if I take his job away or after a certain amount of time, like who's doing the milling, who's doing the growing. It's like, if I grew my own wheat, and I mm. milled my own wheat and I baked my own wheat and I say it now I'm taking away multiple jobs for a system that used to be surviving on trades and what people did and the way of life was dependent upon relationships. And community. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say local too. Yeah. Because of limitations of geography. Because it's expensive to ship yeah. things all over the place. I, I like to really like do regional things when I'm doing events, like say, like in Virginia, some of my grains come from Anson Mills and I have them shipped to Mount Vernon to grind. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I have like my grass farms, which they grow incredible grain. I hadn't really used them before and they're growing some heritage wheat that's just awesome. And, you know, they're not too far away from Mount Vernon. So they came to Mount Vernon and they dropped off the grain and then they saw like 
a traditional mill like work. Now I feel like I've kind of connected those two places, which is awesome because now it's like, oh, cool. Like they're friends now. And maybe, you know, in the future, like my grass farms, like, Hey, we have this seed that we can get. Like, do you guys want to grow it? Cause that'd be awesome because I can use it regionally. And if I can use a bunch of regional farms and the events one, I don't have to carry a bunch of flour with me. Yeah. I can kind of not pack that and just like, hey, just bring it down to Mount Vernon and grind it. And Mount Vernon's pretty much halfway between me and like most of my events. So it kind of works out really well. And it gives, you know, Mount Vernon a chance to, I mean, we've actually ground almost every grain that Washington lists in the mill book 250 years later the same grain. So, you know, when we grew white wheat there, that was about a year and a half or two years ago. That was probably the first time that that wheat had been ground at that mill site for 200 plus years. Oh, I love that. You know, not only are you like creating a storyline for the milling process or the baking process or the growing of the wheat process, you're now like carrying on something that was kind of lost and not done. And I think that's like part of like the mission of Half Crown Bakehouse is to sort of connect things that were in the past before and now, you know, shift 200 plus years later. And now we're trying to like rekindle those relationships between farmers and millers and bakers and trying to reestablish like that whole system of foodways, which is all very, very slow because it's built over time, which is awesome. So I use the migrash flowers myself. I have them delivered to my house. I discovered them back at the beginning of COVID. Like everybody else, I wanted to be baking a lot of bread. So that's an exciting connection too. And, you know, we're between, I guess, Mount Vernon and migrash. We're probably about halfway between those two Mm -hmm. where we are. But uh, yeah, it's all a wonderful community thing. And the connections are just magical. Once it starts happening, we found that so often on this podcast. And it's (laughs) it's just so great. So Justin, what does the good dirt mean to you? So a lot of what I work with and depend upon has to start with soil, literally. I mean, it has to start with like good dirt and a lot of it depends on the regionality of it and the terroir, so to speak, of the grain and how actually it has changed over 250 years, which is dramatic in some places. If you're in like Virginia area, it has changed quite a bit, but I think you can't grow anything good if it doesn't start with good dirt. I mean, I'm not a farmer, like I said, but I know that if you don't have good dirt, you don't really have anything because you can't grow anything, which growing things depends on what I do. And Mm -hmm. think about it as a whole, it depends on a lot of what people do is based upon dirt Yeah, (laughs) and what's grown over centuries, really. So it's kind of like a full circle thing for me. If you don't have that, you don't really have anything. Awesome. That's great. I love that. If you don't have good dirt, you don't really have anything. Yeah, it's so true. It's like the basis of like everything. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Is there anything that you want our audience to understand about what you do or anything else that you want to mention? Yeah, I think that when, you know, people show up at events or historic sites, they kind of think that this is like, oh, I kind of show up and I, you know, start my fire and I start baking bread. Like this is like weeks, if not like months in advance planning I mean, honestly, I really don't know what I'm going to make until like probably a week before. I'm baking like this weekend at Mount Vernon. So (laughs) I'm like throwing together what I'm making depending on the grains that I have. So I take a look at my grains and see what I'm going to make. But, you know, I think in general, there's so much effort and work, which really lucky to have my parents who sometimes travel with me. My mom helps a lot because she is like the person that runs the actual bakehouse like tent. I'm usually by the oven and she's usually explaining all the grains and things like that inside the tent. And my parents both have been like retired for a little bit now. So out of retirement into uh, helping me a little bit. And like my dad comes along and he chops wood and he's kind of like best like, hey, I need I need some more pork butter from the cooler or whatever. And he'll go grab that, which they help out a lot in between their living history stuff. And actually some of our stuff crosses where their living history um, groups or reenactment, our groups are at the same events that I'm set up at, which is super cool too. So we kind of evolved that a little bit because I always thought it would just be like a solo kind of thing. And then sometimes I have some of my friends that I've 
worked with in restaurants in the past, like they come with me for a weekend just to like get out of the restaurant and get into the open air and work out of a clay oven. But it is like a, it's a ton of work because there's so many people involved that like nobody really sees when they show up at an event. It's like, Oh, like you guys were always here. Yeah. It's like setting up and having a grand opening at some place, every single event that we go to, because sometimes they're very new, like Waterford. And sometimes they're places that we've gone for since the beginning, which is like Mount Vernon. You know, it's not like working in a commercial bakery. You're outside, you're like in kind of like historic places that, you know, if you're baking, like in my baking hours are like so weird because like during the day when I'm serving at like an event, like heating up slices of bread or selling loaves, like it took me six hours to get to that point. So that means I was probably up at 2 a.m. Oh my goodness. Or maybe didn't go to sleep at all, just kind of like baked throughout the day into the night. And until you've seen like Mount Vernon at like 1 a.m. with like the moon over top of it, like in November, it's such a cool thing to be having a business, like having a small business where you have the opportunity to like do that. Because I don't know anybody that has a job like that. And I mean, some of the places like to see like where Washington crossed the Delaware and to see like the Delaware River be like glass at like 3 a.m. and like baking bread is like, it's such a historic thing. And it's, you know, I'm very lucky to like be doing what I'm doing and where I'm doing it at. And I think the place probably matters more than the actual bread itself because it goes hand in hand with it. And being at Mount Vernon, being at like Stratford Hall, I'm like on the Potomac, like baking next to an 18th century grist mill, like that's insane. Like, I don't know anybody doing that or getting the opportunity to do that. It's nuts. It's crazy. Justin, I love that. You're so in awe of your own life. <laughs> it's amazing. It's that's really so awesome oh to gosh. hear you talk that's about it. I know. It's so <laughs> great. It makes so us look great. Crazy. It's like worth it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, I bet you. Oh my you gosh. Go. So you just described a few different places where people can come find you baking. But do you have anything planned for spring 2022? Or tell us about where people can find you online, how they can learn more. Yeah. So they can find my crazy schedule at halfcrownbakehouse.com. I post a bunch of stuff on Instagram at halfcrownbakehouse. And yeah, I pretty much put my schedule on there ahead of time. So like spring 2022, I have a few events kind of already booked up. A great thing to kind of like break into like the 18th century world. And there's an awesome event at the last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in April in a place called Big Pool, Maryland. It's Fort Frederick State Park. And they have a giant 18th century market fair. And it is like 160. 18th century artisans. So anything from like pottery to cast iron to like, you know, gourds or round boxes or firkins or 18th century clothing, like any of that stuff. It's basically like a typical 18th century market fair, like all crowded in the one giant Fort Frederick State Park and everybody's making things and or demonstrating and selling. But it's fantastic event for anybody that like wants to see that kind of like lifestyle of like pottery and things being made or want to get in, even into the hobby itself. So cool. That's like the breaking out event of sounds uh, so fun. Yeah. Everybody's been inside for like winter and then like the end of yeah. April, they're like, all right, here we go. <laughs> and then that's usually followed by Mount Vernon's Revolutionary War weekend, which is like the first weekend in May. And that's like where they have about 200 living history reenactors of the American Revolution kind of set up throughout Mount Vernon on the Bowling Green. And there's also some sutlers there, which are, some of them are like 18th century historical artists. Some of them are just 18th century sutlers and sell fabric. And it's also like a miniature version of that market fair, which is great too, because then when I'm on site, they usually mill and I'm baking, you know, within 12 to 20 hours of when it's milled. And they're really yeah. awesome about that. And usually like the guys, the millers that mill it for me at Mount Vernon, they usually come hang out like during the day. So you know, people can kind of ask them questions too, if they're around, like dropping off flour, they're like, Hey, like, how's this work? Because now they see like the whole connection with like the millers and the bakers, like hanging out. And that's like what it should be. Yeah. Oh, that's like, know your source. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Oh, that's so wonderful. Oh, Justin, this has been such a great conversation. I've loved it so much. I want um, some of your bread. I can't yeah. just like buy your bread online. Can I have to come find you in person? Emma, we're going to go to Mount Vernon. Okay. <laughs> there's this weekend. But that's a real next- question. That's a real question just for anyone listening who might, like they need to, it's all in person, right, Justin? Yeah, they need to come okay. in person. I don't ship. I kind of tried that whole thing a little bit. And it's one, I want them to take the bread like while it's like fresh. Yeah. And while it's fresh and while it's hot, that's where it's best. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with us today, Justin. This has been so interesting and now I'm thank just you. I'm hungry. Yeah, thank you for, for bread. Having. Yes, I, I've really loved it. Now I'm now I'm gonna go like bake some bread or something. And build an oven. <laughs> She's yeah. gonna go build it with her yoga ball. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank right. you, Justin. Bye. We really thank appreciate you. it. Bye bye. Thanks so much, Justin. What a great conversation. It's so interesting. And if you're listening here and you live on the East Coast, check out Justin's website at halfcrownbakehouse.com. And there he has a schedule of where he's going to be over the next several months. And if you live near any of these places, we recommend that you go check him out and get some of his wonderful bread now that you know the whole story. And speaking from personal experience go to his table early and first yeah he does run out the lines are something yeah yes so thank you so much for tuning into this conversation today and every friday if you're a regular continue to share your slow living stories with us using the hashtag slow living challenge and it's not too late to join the challenge if you are not getting the emails yet just sign up at our website we have that linked in the show notes as well and don't forget to pre-order our wild farming life from the lady farmer marketplace It is the book by Lynn Cassells from our interview last week. If you haven't listened yet, definitely worth tuning in to that conversation. And if you pre-order from our website, remember that you get a free ticket to our Meet the Author Q&A Zoom gathering that will happen at some point in April. Date to be announced. That's going to be so fun. Yeah, we love Lynn. We can't wait to chat with her again and for all of you guys to meet her. So Thank you so much for being here and tune in next week and every Friday morning for more awesome, good dirt interviews. See you guys next week.